Disruptors and Curious Minds, welcome to another amazing episode of Thinking on Paper. My name is Jeremy Gilbertson. To my, depending on your perspective, my left, your right, Mr. Mark Fielding, still on uh, holiday with the kids. Mark, are we still bouncing around Europe? What's happening? Yeah, still bouncing around Europe. I'm in the UK again, and I just so did. A, sorry, I was just uh, reading a John Kraski post on Barbie and AI, which is why I'm smiling because uh, it, it was quite funny. Um, yeah, I'm in the, I'm in England, and very excited to be doing this. Very cool, very cool. Well, uh, let's let's jump right in today. So we've been messing around with a couple of different formats with with thinking on paper. At first, it was just. Mark and I talking and we quickly learned that we were not interesting enough to uh, to hold uh, hold an audience for a long amount of time. So we decided to bring on some really amazing guests that have been super kind to jump into our fun discussions. And uh, we've done some rabbit hole editions where we go a little bit deeper uh, on certain topics. And today we have what we're calling the triple threat mystery edition. And um so what what our idea with this is to bring on some of your favorite previous guests and unpack a couple things more of a collective sense making engine for not only mark and i but hopefully for the people out there listening as well and uh two things one thing we're going to talk about some controversial opinions related to culture and emerging tech and then we're also going to help each other answer our most baffling questions that our curiosity cannot let loose how does that sound mark is that a good intro it sounds awesome. Let's get into it. So the Willy Wonka uh, meme that you posted in our uh, pre-production thread um, is is very apropos. The suspense is killing us. It's it's killing me. And as as Willy Wonka said, I hope it continues. I hope Maybe it we lasts. Just drag it out a few minutes longer. No, we've already dragged this out long enough. Let's go. Come on. All right. All right. So we're gonna bring them on one at a time. I won't tell you who's coming on uh, particularly, but they might just randomly appear in our chat. Oh my gosh, there's one of them. Nolan Ether back in the house. What's up, guys? Long time, worst kept uh... secret in Web3. <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks good for having me. Good friend of the show. Thanks for jumping into the mix. I'm going to bring in our other guests as we as we continue to go. Uh, let's see who's popping in next. Oh, my gosh. Ben, what what's up? happening? Good to see you again, sir. Good to uh, see happy, you. happy morning time. Thanks for, thanks for being here early. The way you were bringing them in, I thought we were going to do it like Dallas and have it fire. Da, 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 da. Yeah, that's it, right? Corrales, what's happening, my guy? What's up? What's up? Awesome. GM, GM, you, as you they that, say. You got that beautiful baritone voice kind of rocking and rolling with your mic setup, man. It always sounds good. That, well, thank you. That's because it's 730 in the morning here. Well, it's very <laughs> waking GM up. for you too. So same, with, same, with, same with B. Earl, I'm, I'm sure. <laughs> we got, yes. we have our coffees. Uh, yeah, that's right. That's right. Excellent. Well, let's, let's dive right in, guys. Um, so again, I teed this up as kind of this, this collective sense-making vehicle for, for not only our viewers, but ourselves. And hopefully you guys can kind of spin something out of it as well. But let's start with um, with the controversial thoughts. All every audience loves to listen to something that's going to stir the pro stir the pot, break things, all of that kind of stuff. Um, why don't we? Since we brought you on first, Nolan, why don't you hit us? Uh, and there are no wrong answers to this, by the way, guys. Uh, safe room, friendly room, all that fun stuff. But you know, hit us hit us with a thought, uh, Nolan, at the intersection of culture and emerging tech that maybe not not the general public tends to hold or general populace in that world tends to hold. Yeah. Um, I know all you guys pretty well. Glad to be here with all my boys. Um, so I, I, I did craft some of these questions and thoughts specifically to the audience because I thought it might be controversial and would love to hear your opinions. I'm not fully convinced of my own ideas on this. So I'm just going to throw it out there for us to debate and would love to hear you guys talk. But um, for the controversial one, I, I want to throw out that it's possible that emerging tech like generative AI and 3D avatars and real time, you know, kind of 3D uh, virtual beings and things like that could actually wind up after the strikes and after all these things with uh, evolution in Hollywood, evolution in media production could actually wind up being a net positive for creators, writers, actors, um, people in the creative field curious what you guys think about that so let me let me just make sure i understand the yeah. the the thought the right way so that the the actual net result of what we're seeing 
on technology's influence on storytelling in Hollywood and the strike and all of that, if the outcome of all of this will be a net positive to the creators? Yeah, I think that if, you know, it, it's a, there's a clear argument that if it, you know, if Hollywood long-term stays kind of the way that it's always been, then yeah, they can take advantage. They can cut costs. They can cut creatives out. Um, but if it becomes more of about democratization, about ability for people who maybe, you know, haven't had the opportunity or the, you know, ability to you know, publish their own content or get distribution or, you know, do things without living in Hollywood or, you know, whatever, that some of these tools, you know, the, the next generation of IP or big media could come from, you know, three people in this room working together on something. I think that is a nice cold shower wake up for BL to go into that one. <laughs> yeah, that's why I'm that's why that's the question. And I know Corrales probably has some thoughts too. Yeah, I mean I, I can uh, I can jump in on that. I mean I, I, I agree um with reservations, right? Like and I think the interesting thing is what do we define content as? Like what do we define like meaningful evergreen stuff? right? Like, what do we care about? What's going to matter in a hundred years? You know, I mean, you look at the books that we're, we're still reading and, you know, being taught and things like that. And, you know, and, and, and even the films, I mean, the film industry is less than a hundred years old, really. And, you know, you look at like even Marvel, right? I mean, it's less than a hundred years old. You look at the gaming industry, it's less than a hundred years old. I mean, these are really young baby industries for, for the most, you know, sort of, big part of it all and you know obviously books are the oldest like the written form is the oldest and that's been around you know for just a, a several hundred years like where it's been mass consumable so i think you know you have technologies that allow for what we'll look at as being mass consumption as well as opportunities for people to be creative and you know i look at my own career where I was in school for English. I wanted to make film. They, you know, the school I was at wasn't there. And this is the early, like nineties, this is late nineties, early two thousands. But I was able to take, you know, some of my money that was <laughs> set aside for school and uh, that my grandfather so great, great, gratefully uh, left me. And I was able to buy a camera and buy an editing system. And this is when final cut one first came out. So, you know, my career is, is very much, predicated and based off of the fact that, you know, I was able to purchase that technology and go off and make a documentary on comic books when I was 20 years old, 21 years old. And that was really an, an amazing calling card that got me, you know, into the comic book business. And I was always loving comics. And here I am, you know, interviewing Neil Gaiman and, and Frank Miller and all the people I grew up with, John Byrne, and being a fan, but also being able to come at from a different direction and say, you know, I'm here to tell your stories with, you know, our, our team and uh, the director, it was a good friend of mine. So, I mean, you know, I just look at that, right? In the past, like 30 years, these new technologies and 20 years, these new technologies allowing us to be able to tell stories that otherwise weren't able to really be told. You know, we were able to tell the story of comic books and then, you know, footage I shot of Frank Miller because they couldn't get him on camera. PBS actually had to use, you know, they requested, hey, can we get that that footage, that interview you guys shot of Frank because, uh, you know, we need we need some quotes from him. So, you know, I mean, that, that to me, it's like, we were doing this way back when, right? And, you know, I've been always sort of tech adjacent being a film editor. And when I say film, I use that word light, loosely because, you know, I've been working in nonlinear editing systems since I was, you know, 20 years old and working with codecs and, and compression and all that. And and in that ver really early version of Web One, where I was working in a video production arm of a consulting company for Johnson & Johnson, where we were doing compression for, you know, doctor streaming. So, you know, it's, it's all about like, what are you using it for and how is it going to be used? And then ultimately... To your point, you know, it's giving people opportunities that they otherwise wouldn't have had. And I think, you know, the question is, what do you do with that opportunity? 
right? Like, what do you do with this new technology? What do you do with these cameras? I mean, now you can learn, I'm also a musician. So it's like, you know, I don't, musician, I guess people have, people say that they're a musician when they're making money, making music. I guess that's like <laughs> a writer, but I guess, you know, incorrect, to me, incorrect. You know, if you can I play an instrument, you're already a musician. Yeah. You know, you're a musician. Well, you play music, you know, I've got, a, I host a jam at the rainbow, but for me, music was such a big part of all of it. And, you know, even making electronic music and using things like Rebirth back in the day, you know, and burning CDs on my computer and handing them out to friends in college, being like, yo, check out this cool dance track I made, you know? And again, that's technology that's allowing us, instead of having to have, you know, the 808s and, you know, the SP 1500s and things like that, you know, you now have these technologies like literally on your phone. I have iMachine on my phone. I can bring it home and I can use this micro to make beats. I mean, I look at all this as like it's it's a large sort of interwoven piece of, of opportunity for people to make creative cool shit. Like that's the bottom line. And I think, you know, I've been working with AI for the past two years. Well, AI, large language models. We've been open AI developers for the past two years. We've been working very closely with it, been seeing how it's all been changing and the, the speed when chat GPT came out. So, you know, I think there's a lot of, a lot of reservations here in Hollywood. You know, I mean, I've been working in Hollywood for 20 plus years as well. And, you know, and I think there's, there's a lot of fear of new technologies sort of shifting things, but at the end of the day, um, you know, writers, creators, I think there are people that are true artists that have visions and want to tell those stories. And then there are people that are, good enough to copy and they'll only stay there. And I think that's where AI and things like that are going to start replacing where you are just the best version of all of the sort of amalgamations of everything else. And, and if you're not rising above that, that's where you're going to get replaced. So, you know, cut your teeth, get your craft together. It's cool. Like, honestly, as a writer, like, you know, I, I still look at like guys like Neil Gaiman and Grant Morrison and Alan Moore as sort of my North stars, even when I'm doing my writing, you know, but I've been finding even, you know, I look at my, my, I get this Daredevil series out right now. And I look at that and I compare that back to what I was even writing three years ago. And I go, wow, like I've been finding my voice. And I think we find our voice as we develop and grow. And, you know, new technologies and things like that can help you expedite your confidence and ability to find that voice. Because, you know, a lot of times you don't have that support network around you. You don't have those great editors. You don't have someone like Taboo going, dude, you're, you can do it. I believe in you, man. Like, you're awesome. And, you know, and like those kinds of voices, we need those communities. We need people that we can go, yeah, you've done it. I believe, I, yeah, why can't I, why am I not? And I think those are new ways technologies can also connect us and allow us to have that confidence. So I love it. That's my yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I think, no, I think it's, I think it's great. I, I, I want, I want to, so I, I loved your point on the idea of, um, okay. So the, so the, so the general, general public will largely be able to produce some sort of story-based content at a relatively reasonable level right eventually right so it's it's like hey creators time to tighten it up a little bit let's get even a little bit better to figure out how to wiggle wiggle through that piece another uh bit of dust i want to sprinkle on this before we throw it to corrales is the idea have you guys ever read um any of uh tim timothy Wu's work um i can't remember actually the name of the book but he's the guy that coined the phrase net neutrality and um it's it, this one book he wrote, I'll, I'll have to dig it up while you guys are talking, talks about open and closed systems, how every technology oscillates through open and closed sectors. The film industry did it for a while where Edison basically controlled all the tech, controlled all the content. And then that went a little bit open. It was with theaters were the same way that the Fox theater and the distribution was controlled. And then it kind of got open. I think it's really interesting that we keep seeing these cycles like he's not wrong. Like we're, it's a cyclical pattern. It's just like, you know, it, it, it's just like night and day. It's, it's just what happens. But um, Corrales, give us your thoughts. Can, can, on, can, can yeah. I'm just going to, can I just, I want to pick up on that last bit before Carlos goes. Ben was saying about the finding your voice. And I'm thinking, so the deco the deco making it possible for anybody to create a lot of the Web3 platforms are giving that opportunity now. And a lot of the people who didn't create are now creating there. And there's a big 
discussion between using AI and it becoming a crutch or not using AI and not nobody's saying really that AI can help you find your voice. There's a lot of people saying that it can weaken your voice because you rely on it so much, but it's interesting to hear be saying that it can be used to quickly find your voice or to help you find your voice. I find that very interesting. I, I think that goes back to confidence, right? As a creative, as a writer, as, musician, as whatever you are, you know, look, the big thing comes down to, do you have something to say and do we care? Right? Like there's so much YouTube stuff out there that at the end of the day, it's like, it's, it's not, it's mimic. It has its moment. My son watches it. He has a laugh and then, okay, moving on. Right. But for him right now, basketball is everything and anything he cares about. He will follow anyone that's like any sport, whatever. So it's like someone making that sort of content, someone researching that sort of stuff, someone really getting deep into the weeds of it and using let's say, you know, uh, uh, an open AI or, or whatever llama or whatever large language model to, to really sort of put together that content, you know, and someone that maybe like my son who loves basketball. And then what if he's like, well, you know, let me use this to help do my research and make sure my research is right and things like that. So you start getting the confidence. Now the question is, is that has it been trained on good data? Like that's a whole other conversation, you know, <laughs> is the information you're getting good? Is it helping you create good copy is another question too. Is it helping you format things? I mean, you know, I've got here, you know, as a writer, you got your strunk and white, right? Oh, am I in the right tense? Am I, you know, like we have our little crutches, right? Like we have our books, we have our different things. If we're using technology to basically bring that all together in one place and be able to have a conversational and engagement with those those pieces of tech, you know, the, this is technology right here. This is a book, right? It was written by someone. It was printed on something. Well, I need that information. How quickly can I get it and make sure that it's giving you the confidence to know that I'm doing something correctly and that I'm getting the voice and vision that I need out? I think that's where it can really be good. And I think that's going to come down to training on on the right data sets and more enclosed systems to that point, you know, a closed system of correct data sets that ultimately can really help creatives find that confidence and voice to know what they're putting out is, you know, within, <laughs> within the bounds and confines of what we are used to reading. And then once you've learned the rules, then you go be Picasso, then you go break it, then you go figure out how to make it your thing and do some crazy weird shit, you know, but learn the structure, learn the stuff that they teach you in school first, you know, and if you can't afford to go to school, then this is where the internet and this is where new technologies give you those opportunities to start learning that kind of stuff that gives you that confidence to go and say, okay, I have something to say. Now I'm going to go out and say it. And I know I'm going to do it in a way that's going to, you know, fit what the parameters are that people are used to. And then I'll be able to figure out my own way. And that's where I can find my voice. So I think that's, there it is. Yep. No, I love, yeah, that's it, man. That's it. Um, Corrales, hit us with, hit us with Nolan's hot take. Uh, is the, are we going to be better yeah. off eventually? Uh, um, creators going to be better off eventually after this, uh, this Tim Wu cycle. Yeah, it's a, it's a good one. I, I think it's interesting, uh, just hearing all the perspectives and, 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 you know, especially, you know, be your all being in the, you know, in the mix. Um, I, I mean, in, in, <laughs> In keeping with the topic of the show, I'll say I think AI is horrible, um, and I don't. I like I love AI. I mean, just wrote a post about it. What I mean by that is I don't. I think it's horrible in the way it's being implemented. And Hollywood, what we're seeing, I think is a is a what I would say is a bellwether case that is going to. This is what the future is going to hold for all industries, and that's because um, it's being used. It's being weaponized against people. Um, it's a tool, it's a cold tool for economics and for quick hit, quick, quick wins. There is no culture. There's no community around AI. It's just, how can I get mine and how can I be better than the next guy? And that's why I think Web3 blockchain and an, an ethos of, of community, um, which AI simply doesn't have right now, is going to benefit aside from the, the technical implementations of putting checks and balances on AI. But that said, what, what I'll bring into the conversation about Hollywood, um, I also have a lot of my, my you know, I have, um, you know, lots of my cousins are, are in Hollywood and, and studio heads and so forth. 
um, one one of the not studio heads. I'll I'll just say they're they're in the industry, uh, but but um, one thing that that troubles me about this situation that I think is going to blow come into all industries eventually, very soon is that AI is uh, the way that AI is being used in Hollywood is kind of like a lot of these writers uh, are were underpaid to begin with. So a lot of streaming and that kind of stuff, these people were making pennies on the dollar in, in a lot of ways, the, these creators and not getting credit. And, and a lot of it falls along racial lines. A lot of it falls along um, gender, that kind of thing. So we see that a lot in, in a lot of stuff. So AI comes along and, and a lot of the decision makers say, hey, we can basically replace you. Well, they've already replaced these people. They're, they're already using them. And and I think that's the unfair thing about AI. And and now it's like, oh well, you have to you have to learn all the AI stuff, man. You got to get on the get on the, the the bandwagon. And and I think that's that's the big problem with legacy uh, legacy or AI building into legacy systems so quickly without thinking. And and that's why I think um, that and, and that's for that's that's for lack of vision. That's for lack of culture. Um, and that's my big problem with AI. I love AI. I think it's I think it's crucial for Web three. I think it's crucial for blockchain. But but eventually, I think we're going to see some very very bad situations across all industries. And I think the Hollywood thing, where people are rising up right now about and and you know protesting the situation. I don't think they're going against AI. I think what they're going against is the unfair treatment that they they were already faced with. And now AI is this easy thing to say, well, you know what? You guys are just behind the times. Come on. So that, that's why I don't like a lot of the AI implementation, even in the tool sets that we use, the, the SaaS tools that we see. It's like, did I ask for this? No, no one asked for this. They just, they just built it in. They, 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 they literally baked it in. Everyone is going crazy about it. Like it's, you know, the next, the bit it's, oh, it's this revolution. Look what Adobe did. Look what this did, you know, and, you know, being in web three, you know, a lot of us know we don't, enjoy, we don't, we don't get that enjoyment. Um, but I, but now I look at it and I'm like, I don't want that enjoyment. In fact, I think there, that's the reason that a lot of blockchain is here to, to pull back on that stuff and say, wait a minute there needs to be consensus about this. There needs to be decisions made. Um, you guys, you guys sitting behind your, you know, your, your decision makers at Adobe implementing AI into everything. That's not the way this is going to work. But yet if, if we, if we continue to think like that, I think it's going to be very bad consequences. What about, what about this idea of, you know, the, pulling, pulling back the thread a little bit, getting back to first principles approach on, on, on this stuff. Ben, you, you referenced a book, you know, I've got William Zinser's book that I go to all the time to figure out if I'm saying it in digestible frameworks and all of that. But here's the thing. I trust the book. I trust the guy that wrote the book because he's proven himself to me, right? As a resource over time. But with these AI, this like latest tech, there's no, there's no trust validator and humans love shortcuts. So how do we balance this trust validation with our desire to optimize every freaking thing in our lives? That's a, that's a good question because I think, yeah. you know, we've Excellent. grown up on systems that like books, right? You have a series of gatekeepers, right? You have the publisher, you have editors. Um, I mean, it's like anything, right? Do you trust that brand? Do you trust that they're going to give you something, right? If you're buying yogurt, do you go to Dannon or do you go to Brand X? Like, you know, those are the questions that, that come back to you. And, and maybe they're both exactly the same and maybe they're both great, you know. Um, but it's it's always sort of up to how are you presented the material, the information. And I think, you know, for us, it's like it's unfortunate that the Internet has, you know, it's it's great. But at the same time, like if you don't have great gatekeepers like on Wikipedia, making sure that all that information is up to date and really, you know, those people that we've seen on like, uh, you know, not Vice, but, you know, those those you're like, oh, that's the guy. There's that one guy who like literally lives on Wikipedia, updating everything, making sure he's like written them like those people. 
those are people that are dedicated to the craft, that are dedicated to information, that are dedicated to human integrity. And I think we have yet to see that because of how, you know, these large language models being trained on so much data and ultimately just trained to scale right now. And it's like this arms race of information. And we're in, you know, I think in history is going to look back on this and go, this was a different sort of arms race. You know, we were watching these big tech companies coming in and trying to win, you know, with the information, you know, we've been coming in this information age, right? Now we've kind of sort of come to this like flashpoint of information can be so quickly, you know, cultivated, created, uh, <laughs> resource pulled in and you're looking and going, holy shit. And, and we're using these neural networks to do it. And wow, like this is amazing. And it's like, we're just so caught up in our own hubris and how awesome we are. And you have like guys like Elon Musk who just say things to say things to disrupt them. And you're just like, where are we right now as humans? Like, what are we, <laughs> like, what are we going towards? What's our there there? Like, are we really looking and saying, are we trying to go to the singularity? Do we just want to get out of these meat machines and put ourselves into a consciousness that exists throughout everything in the universe? Is like, is that where we're going? And are we trying to get there in 3,000 years? Or are we just trying to actually experience and enjoy life? And, and these are just experience machines. And they're not machines. I mean, I think, you know, the human brain is so much more fascinating than we even give it, you know, real reference and we think that we are gods and we can replicate that and i think that's really very sort of uh uh arrogant to think that you know the the brain that has been organically grown for some crazy amount of time and who knows maybe we can get into ancient aliens and maybe there was you know the psychedelic side of it or maybe some aliens came down and tamper with us to make us get that leap <laughs> who knows we go into fiction or maybe it's real but i think that's the question it's like why are we doing it and where are we going because if we're not a asking in those questions right now, and if we're just doing it, well, we can because, well, that's stupid. You know, like, how do we do it and say like, yeah, is it making us better? Is it gonna make our kids better? Because we're really, you know, I forget who said the quote, but it's like, we're leasing this planet right now. And especially us that are in that age of like 30 to 50, you know, especially the Gen Xers. And a friend of mine was telling me, who's also a 1980er, like we're in this weird cosmos. You know, like we live between these worlds. We're not really a millennial and we're not really Gen X. And, and you know, I think those of us in this sort of mix between, you know, the Gen X generation really does have sort of a, a, an obligation to help, you know, kind of craft towards where we're going. But we're handing it off. I mean, I look at my 12 year old and I'm going, this is your world. It's not mine. Like... At this point, like, yeah, there's things I want to do. There's things I still am, like, looking to keep doing. But you're the one who's about to inherit it in the next, you know, eight to ten years. And, I mean, you're and, inheriting and, it now. I mean, like, where you and start. To that to point, where yeah, and to that point. Where I was to that point. You know. Exactly. So, yeah. And to that point is, is like, you know, what, what disturbs me about a lot of this is, like, what's the first thing when when OpenAI and, and ChatGPT starts exploding and, and Bard comes out? they they eliminate they quietly eliminate all of their their uh ethics ai ethics that's a telling microsoft did it uh google didn't and there's no blowback elon i mean if anyone thinks elon musk is as brilliant as he is if anyone thinks he has any ethics you know they're 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 barking up the wrong tree this guy might be a genius but ethically he's he is not and and so are you gonna no one expects any ethics coming out of x or whatever he's doing right so this is just gone and it's like to be earl's point it's like where are we going with this is it just to build the fastest engine uh the biggest rocket ship uh okay i guess that's what's happening <laughs> and uh but yeah you you see this like weird psychology of like people literally fearing this is this is where I think we need to pay attention. People are fearing for their future. And this is not just relegated to, quote unquote, low end workers anymore. We're talking doctors. We're talking attorneys. Um, not that they're any more special than than anyone else. But but the point is that everyone is just sort of passing it off and going, let's just see what happens. <laughs> OK, that's, I don't know where this is going. We can't we have no control. Really, we have no control over anything. No, we we don't have any control over it. Just it just goes. 
and you just you just ride on that rocket ship. What if it explodes? Well, oh well, you know. <laughs> I don't well, know. No, yeah, no, <laughs> no, I, I agree with you, Corrales. And where my head goes, and, and Nolan, I'd love your thoughts on this. Like where, where my head goes with this is what we see with tech and innovation. It's like, hey, get out of the way. We're building stuff. We're changing the world. Get out of the way. We'll figure it out later. We're it's building. like, yeah, yeah it's, we're building, we're building. And money gets thrown at think people that build stuff. And and so, Nolan, how what, how do you see us like kind of- Only a kind few people are saying that. Yeah. A lot of, only a few people are saying that. Most people are just jumping on the bandwagon and going, okay, they're changing the world. I'm going with them because I don't have any other op- op- idea of my own. Yeah, yeah. so how do we, I, yeah, how do we balance really, that, Nolan? Yeah, what's the, what are your, where's your- I heard a really interesting, I'm actually in the middle of it because it's one of those podcasts where you like, I listen to it like 15 minutes at a time because there's so much in there that you want to like digest. But it's a conversation between uh, Mark Andreessen uh, from Andreessen Horowitz and Lex Friedman talking about AI. And those conversations are always great. Lex is a great interviewer. And and they're talking about uh, like the gatekeepers and how, you know, I, it sounds like Mark is a big believer in AI overall and kind of uh, the potential for people and that uh, information or intellect or um, you know, those types of things are what make people better and stronger. And that like on, on every measure across humanity and like quality of life, like if you're more intelligent, then you're better equipped to handle the issues and things like that. And so then, you know, that then leads to, well, what happens when, you know, chat GPT evolves and things like that. And people have a, you know, call it 140 IQ personal assistant whose entire existence is only to improve your life. They are your biggest cheerleader. They're never going to tell you no. They're going to be infinitely patient. They're going to answer any questions you have, take as long as you need to go through it, teach you things, you know, and then, so, so you've got 140 IQ. If, if someone's got 140 IQ already, then you've got a partner. If someone's less than 140 IQ, you've got somebody potentially more intelligent you to, than you to balance things off of. And if you're above 140 IQ, you have somebody to, to hand off menial tasks and things like that, right? But then the question becomes, well, who's the gatekeeper that built that 140 IQ person? Do they share the same values as you, you know, deep in that large language model? Are they going to influence you in some way? Who's deciding all of those types of things? And, 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 and that's where we get into, you know, some of the regulation and conversations about how we make sure that this is something that uh, isn't going to destroy humanity and is only going to help humanity. But it's, you know, I think it's, there's no doubt it's like, potentially the most impactful technology of our lifetimes or maybe in the history of humanity. Uh, but that could go both ways, right? When you, if you, if we get 140 IQ person and then let's call it three years from now, it's 180. Well, that's better than Einstein. So if everybody has a personal assistant, that's more intelligent than Albert Einstein, well, you know, <laughs> what does that mean for humanity? Could be good. Could be bad. But, depends but you on know the what, person. You know what's what's you know, going to get interesting about that. No one like, that when people talk about that, they forget the connections that were made be- to get to the Einstein and then Einstein to other people. It's not just about the high intelligence. It- it- it's about the connections that were made and that process of maybe you could call it an inexplicable process or whatever, but communication between people that builds true meaning and value, right? That That's the secret. So- yeah. That's the sauce. That's the good stuff. And like, I think a lot of the guys in this room and a lot of people in our communities probably shared a lot of the same values in, in some ways, because I've had really deep conversations with a bunch of you, but like, what happens if you don't like, what happens if the person that built that particular model yeah. doesn't share those values? Exactly. What happens then? And even if, and even if they do, even if we all think that our values are the right values, there are people out there who disagree with us. They don't want their one large language models built on our values either. So yeah. You know what happens here's, then. Here's so. an interesting thought too. So Ben, you earlier you described just the accessibility of the technology that we now can use to create. You got early access to cameras and editing suites and stuff. And we talked about we can do all these great things on our phone, like make a hit song, right? So just because just because I have access to that, you know, does it it doesn't necessarily mean I have the patience to learn and understand and figure out how to interact with it, right? So we've all been in rooms with wicked smart people, you know, gratefully, thankfully that are even over our heads. And, you know, in some of those conversations, I'm like, oh my God, I don't even know where to begin the translation 
between where I'm at and where this particular individual is at. So Ben, Ben, what, what would, if here's my question, that was more a comment. Here's my question. So it sounds like we're all going to have droids like R2D2 and, and C3PO as co-pilots for our existence uh, through our world and its transition to our kids. Ben, what, what, um, if it was like a Tinder or dating app, what would you set as your requirements for your R2D2 C3PO? Well, you know, here's the thing. And I think the one question we're not getting into, and it's called artificial intelligence, is what is intelligence? Like what makes something intelligent, right? Like what makes, and then there's consciousness. And I think we're not really touching on the bigger idea of consciousness, right? Like is a tree conscious, right? Like would I like to, if I could tap a tree and be like, yo, tell me all the stuff that you've seen in the past 300 years on this street right here out front. There's this pepper tree that's 300 years old. That's a communication thing. Obviously, I can't talk to a tree because I don't have the same language as a tree does. A tree is able to talk to, you know, the forest through its. Those are the kinds of things where I start thinking, you know, what is communication? What is consciousness? Because we as humans have become the measure of intelligence. We've measured intelligence, you know, talking about 140 IQ. We put these metrics, we create these numbers, we create these quantitative systems and say, this is what is smart. And then you're all stupid, you know, and, and unfortunately that's really created a lot of problems, you know, especially within like what we've called special needs, like kids then get put into, you know, you're in the remedial program because you're not, you're not in this, you're not smart enough to catch up. But what if that kid is brilliant at art, brilliant at some other sort of device. And a teacher is not able to recognize that, right? Someone that we put in charge of that system. That's where the problem starts to break down. That's where we start looking at. We call these people experts. We call these people, and this is like the same with these large language models, these data scientists, these geniuses as Elon Musk. What makes someone a genius, right? Like why is, why is Elon Musk a genius? Because he made a ton of money, because he got a lot of smart people around him and got them to do all the amazing work that made him a lot of money. And we then go into the metrics of finance, right? Currency, money, what is that? That makes you brilliant if you have all this money that you saw a golden opportunity because you were in the right place at the right time. I would call that sometimes luck, right? But luck is the opportunity to be able to take that thing that you have. And, you know, was, was uh, what's his name? Who, who created Amazon? You know, Bezos. Was it the guy? He already had money. He was in Wall Street. He saw an opportunity. He took it. That smart business. Does that make him a genius? I mean, I think these are the bigger questions, right? Like where you start looking at someone like Einstein. The reason why Einstein, who like didn't speak for years, right, was like the guy was a genius because he saw things differently than we did. He saw things differently than what a large language model would see. Because all, excuse me, all large language model is trained on is everything that's already existed. It hasn't seen what's coming. And it can be predictive. It can be inferral. Like it can have inference based off all the stuff we've already learned. But someone like an Einstein saw something differently with space time. Saw how things interacted differently. Same with Newton. Same with you know uh, all these all these folks, all these philosophers and people saw things differently. Their intelligence was not based off of what we call intelligence because there's those people that are smart you can call them book smart or whatever they could learn everything that have a photographic encyclopedic knowledge but how they use that information that's what makes them really sort of you know <laughs> intelligent and and i guess that goes yeah. back to the question what is intelligence like i would and, rather and i think we should Oh, you sorry. Know, yeah. I, I, I was going to say, say i don't think we should question, but yeah <laughs> and we <laughs> should not discount you know kind of a, a a nod to the to the movie interstellar if anyone's seen it we should not discount the things that we don't know like love this and like right you can't explain that now ai ai this does not have this <laughs> does just on right. that so does creativity come from intelligence or consciousness because you bet you be or you ask like what's the difference between consciousness and intelligence and if, if you look at some animals in the animal kingdom they're creative there's no question that they're creative but they don't show consciousness so if, if the, the the creative act comes from intelligence rather well, than consciousness, is, consciousness. Is a really big question i mean i think there's everything is consciousness i mean you know if you look at uh, religions like like islam and and you know everything is conscious if you you know a rock has consciousness native indigenous cultures look at you know things having consciousness these myths that we look at you know 
um, the Spider-Man story I wrote, the rock literally has consciousness and that's what gives birth to dream spider. You know, the question of what consciousness is, is, is something we're not even touching on. We just keep talking about intelligence, you know, and I think to your point, Corrales, like consciousness connects to love. It connects to community. It connects to all these things. You know, I mean, trees have community. You know, the forest is a community. The forest is really the first worldwide web of its own, right? With mushrooms and all these things speaking to each other. I mean, that to me is fascinating. Nature has more from us for us to learn from than than any of this other stuff. We just keep thinking that we we're so stuck in this very, um, you know, uh, <laughs> what's the word? Where we're always incestual. We're stuck in an incestual intelligence cycle right? We just keep thinking we're so smart. So we just keep going back to our own intelligence where there's really brilliant people out there that are looking at, you know, how nature communicates, how things in the universe, because we're just a, a speck, a microcosm of a macrocosm. You know, people say your eye, your pupil is a black hole, right? Like there's so much, like if we look at our eyes, even how they connect to the cosmos and, and, and these sort of replications of the universe itself. And the fact that we're made of like all of the elements, you know, <laughs> that live on all of these other planets throughout all of the universe. That's pretty crazy, man. Like, that's the stuff we're not like looking at. How does that relate to our existence and what we're so myopic on? I mean, I really believe, and I said this in a post on LinkedIn, I said, you know, we're living in a dark age because we really are so focused on these little pockets and we're walking around like we think we know everything, but we have these blinders on. They were saying, we're brilliant because we inter we created the internet. We're brilliant because we've created these atomic age. We've, you know, it's like, yeah, I mean, in a thousand years, are we gonna look back and go, God, we were just so childish. We had no idea what we were doing. I mean, to me, like, what if, what if in a thousand years, we could resurrect consciousnesses. What if like my consciousness is existing in a thousand years in some computer somewhere? Cause they were like, we really like this guy. Years. We liked his writing and all the cool shit that he did for, you know, <laughs> and like, and I don't even know it. They even created this version of me that's living out there a thousand years based off of this interview right now, this podcast we're having, because they've called this information and said, we like what these guys were saying. We're going to recreate them and have them run iterations of this podcast thousands of years you know over and over well, well i like so, your optimism that we're still here in a thousand years so that's, that's <laughs> well no hey ben right. ben you're you're hitting on a couple of really awesome things right the the whole mycelium network forest trees being able to talk i'm such a nerd about that stuff and i really believe it because as a tree as trees can sense other trees who need help they can send nutrients that way it's it's proven it's fact and then also Theoretical physicist, Michio Kaku, if you've never read any of his stuff, he's kind of Brian Greene-esque, right? Talks about beaming consciousness across space-time, right? So that that's old news. That was that was like, he was thought about that stuff in the 90s. But um, no, I think, I think it's really interesting. One last thought for you, the idea is, isn't it in an effort for us, like all the shit humans do, is it not an effort for us to control and exert influence on our environment i mean I, 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 let me just say first i'm so glad that this somehow pivoted to consciousness because that was going to be my other like cerebral question that was at the end which we may or may not have time for um i was going to say real quick mark the uh you're talking about like some animals not having consciousness. Like I, I'm a big fan of Sam Harris, which I'm guessing some of you guys oh, yeah. uh, spent some time with. And he, he spends a lot of time thinking about consciousness and the way he's kind of nailed down how he defines it. Cause it's kind of, you know, very difficult to define is if there is some, if it's like something to be something, then it's conscious. It may be consciousness is going to look different for a spider than it is for a squirrel than it is for a person. But if that for that spider, it is like something to be a spider and it's not just kind of on autopilot, then that being is conscious. Um, Jeremy, can you rephrase your question? Because I, I was going to uh, eloquently controlling environment slide right? into it. And then well, I, I was thinking about wrapping it back up into like the storytelling yeah. world because gotcha. we're all kind of storytellers and we have yeah. mental models of what we believe the world to be. And then maybe we have a flaw. Oh, that my million model million. is over. Yeah. Right. So I'm trying to control my world versus my, my in my mental model. Right. So how much of what we yeah, do as I, humans is related to that? 
I think your world, I think I agree with that. I just would replace the word environment again with consciousness. I think consciousness, the only thing that is real is consciousness. The only thing that is real is your consciousness for you. And so I think everything you're doing is to impact your, you know, your uh, experience of the world in some way, even if it's to make yourself feel better because you think you're impacting the larger world. Um, but in some way, you know, you're impacting your own experience and consciousness. So yeah, I, I don't know about environment because I think that, you know, that's a slightly differently defined, but I think you're, you're ultimately trying to impact what your experience is. So we, we've gone, we've gone, uh, we're, we're getting close to time and I, uh, man, I'd love to like continue riffing on all this stuff, but why don't we, why don't we end with this and we'll go right around the horn. Um, we've talked about a lot of deep stuff, right? We've talked about consciousness. We've talked about um, like the, the, the nature of human tendency to build and tech and tech and ethics and all of that. Let's flip around the horn and give the audience like one person that you or one writer, one thought leader, one, someone you trust as your go-to to help build your understanding of, of what's happening right now, right now at this intersection of tech and, and, and culture. Uh, ben, you first. Well, I mean, I'm just going to go with Stephen West because I, I care less about tech because tech is constantly changing right? Like we can't keep up with it. You can read all the newsletters you want every day, but if you don't have a lens to be able to look at where we came from, you know, and really understand the philosophy of mind and look at like, again, going back to consciousness, you know, <laughs> there's so much that has been explored over the past, you know, several thousand years and just human understanding and intellect and, and, and creative and all of those things um, I love Stephen West. He's got a great podcast called Philosophize This. Uh, over the pandemic, I literally listened to every episode and then go, went back and listened to them all again. Um, you know, now he's like he's getting back to putting out new content in a, in a you know new episodes uh, a little bit more um, frequently. But I think he's great because he takes a lot of really great information from all these philosophers. His last episode was on AI, actually. Uh, he spoke about, you know, the chat GPT, he spoke about Noam Chomsky, you know, so he looks at it from a very holistic point of view, but, and, and, and really explores it through, uh, the lens of philosophy at large over, you know, uh, the, <laughs> the amount of time as we've existed as humans. So I would say Stephen West is a great one. I recommend his podcast to everyone. I mean, obviously Sam Harris and all these other ones, there's a lot of really big ones, but I think Stephen you know, does a great job and it's funny and it's really bite-sized, you know, 30 minutes, you really get a great, like deep dive into a lot of amazing topics. And then I go out and I buy all the books and I go and buy different, you know, things there you go. he's talking about. And I'm like, all right, now I can go deeper. And I think that's really important, you know? So anyway, that's, that's my, that's my. Awesome. Opinion. Awesome. That's great. Corrales, what about you? Um, I'm going to, you know, in, in keeping with um, brand new voices philosophy, I'll say it, it, it's us. Um, it's you and me, it, it, it's, it's, um, you know, like I say, you know, you, you don't, you don't learn web three. I, I'll apply the same thing to AI and all of it. Um, you don't learn it. You, you, you are it and you manifest it, you create it. There's, you know, I really believe more and more in, uh, you know, energy levels. I don't know if you would call it energy, but I think there is a, a, a deep connection with neuroscience, how we, how we, uh, the stories we tell ourselves, the pathways that get built in our brains, and then manifesting that. And so I think I think that's gone beyond. There's there's more serious talk about that these days. That that's actually how it works. That's how. Uh, so so you you will things into existence rather than just passively learning them. And and I think that that um, I just read a piece on that the universe itself may very well be that. Um, and if anyone's watched like the show, um, the, the movie, well, a lot of people watch it, that, what, what is it everywhere, everything all at once. This is to me is oh, yeah. in a line with that. Like you are the multiverse. You are the creator of that through your, your family, your heritage, your culture. I think it's a beautiful telling of that. Um, which I like, I talk about a lot, like heritage culture, um, being connected to these things, love things that you, we typically are, can't explain but they are the creators of all these things and, and perhaps the universe itself and, and beyond. So that's what I'll say um, as, as far as um, just, just going, going deeper in 
um, rather than just always trying to learn, learn, learn uh, outwardly. Got it. Got it. Uh, before we go over to Nolan for your, for your thoughts, I'll, I'll tack on. So we talked about things like everything like as potential, right. In this many world uh, interpretation kind of thing. So if, if no one has read anything uh, from Richard Feynman, I would uh, highly recommend that as, as a source of kind of understanding the nature of quantum mechanics as it applies to all the stuff that, that Corrales talked about. Uh, Nolan. Yeah, uh, I love what everybody said here. I don't have a specific person. I could probably name a whole bunch and we've named a few here, but I, I find that if you start thinking about the world the way that we're talking about here and about consciousness, the way that we're talking about here and energy, then if you go back to ancient wisdom and you strip away whatever political you know, uh, connections there were there that influenced the story and the perspective, which of course you're going to find in every religion and every piece of time, you know, they're, they're trying to uh, play into the history or they're trying to grasp for power or whatever. But if you strip a lot of that stuff away, um, you find that it's all the same stuff we're talking about. And so uh, I think that that, you know, I, I find myself going back to ancient wisdoms and religious texts from all over the world. And, and, you know, if you look at it, not from a kind of secular or, or modern religious point of view, but more from the point of view of what they were probably trying to get across and strip that stuff out. I think it's all, we're all telling the same story. We're all the same thing. We're all energy. We're all the universe. God is us. We are God. We create our own, uh, you know, reality and consciousness is all there is. So, um, so yeah. I love it guys. We went deep today. Uh, and I wish Hold we were... what about me? I want to go. All right. <laughs> Mark, you're up. You're you're up, up, Mark, me up. No, I've just been thinking going back a number of things, but what Carla said about Einstein and the, his IQ and his, but he didn't get 140 IQ like that, did he? He got 140 IQ over 60, 70 years. I don't know what point his IQ was the highest, but it, and I was thinking, cause that kind of ties into the book and the hero's journey. It's the journey, like j intelligence is a journey, right? And if you're just given an IQ of 140, if it's just downloaded into your AI assistant, what's missing? from that 140, 160, 180 IQ that you can only get from the day-to-day -day existence of being alive that you can't get by however many, how much data is put into you. Is there something missing there? Um, but my, I know that you're familiar with, especially like Joseph Campbell. I'm reading The Power of the Myth and he's I don't know if it's the point in my life at the moment with my kids kind of reaching the age of reason and I, maybe what age is, what age is that? I've got some old kids that aren't quite there yet. <laughs> well, <laughs> waiting for that one. But the, the age of reason is that's a whole other topic. That's right. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's next week. And I think it just ties in really well with what Nolan was saying and what everyone's been saying about we are all essentially the same. But just tying back to AI. So what I've got this by me because I'm on holiday and I'm not writing. So what I'm doing is I'm using AI to create um, a new framework. So I'm taking <laughs> Joseph Campbell's Hero's Journey, bringing in Pixar's like 21 Rules of Storytelling and Blake Snyder's Save the Cat to create a new <laughs> framework that's ethical, like kind of ethical, historical, mystical storytelling into some kind of new, because I know you like frameworks, Jeremy, so that's kind of for you. So yeah, Joseph Campbell. We need to we need to talk, Mark, because I'm working on a similar similar project. Oh wow, wow, okay, definitely. Can you can you send me the prompt that you're using for that? <laughs> After I the show, I'll, I'll just I want to do the it, same thing. It's <laughs> I, it's I don't really use prompts. I kind of like to converse. Yeah, I kidding. think it's more uh, yeah. more more. Uh, oh, more you you're bizarre. literally what? you're plugged into the the. There was a Star Trek episode yeah. where the guy just plugs into the computer and just. They start going, you know. Maybe I think this is a whole other. Yeah, this is but... a whole other podcast. This is like a whole because I'm actually <laughs> working with the Joseph Campbell Institute. So I mean, you know, wow. that's like a. We should... I want to. I want to see Mark plugged into the AI. That's well, the no, show. because he's got a. He's just, got a that's the opener. He's got a thunderbolt port ask... right underneath his ear. A yeah. thunderbolt yeah, no. port. There you go. Just, as I passed, it, as I, I want to know what Jeremy's is. But can I just say that? R2D2, C3PO, Luke Skywalker turned it off. Oh. Hey, computers need power, guys. Computers need network. You know, Damn. who controls that no. controls them. And batteries. <laughs> Double A's. And batteries. Oh, I think guys, you know uh, I, <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, I, yeah. Just in the interest of time, guys, I, I, I think we'll probably ought to uh, kind of reel it in. I know we could like keep keep this thing rolling, but thanks for <laughs> thanks so much for jumping in and stirring the pot yeah. with such an unexpected and, and strange request early on this week. And um, you know, always love what you guys do, and um, definitely stay in touch. Mark, do you have any closing thoughts before we get out of Dodge? They were my closing thoughts. So thank you. It's been awesome. And we didn't really know what to expect when we did this. Um, and I don't think we could have expected it to be this this cool. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah. What a great group. Thank you guys yeah. for pulling it together. Thanks, awesome. And hey, check it. yeah, just some quick closing thoughts. Thinking on paper.xyz is where you can find all this stuff. Send us a note. Let us know what you think of these format formats and, and, and test models and all that good stuff. And we will see you next week. Take it easy. See you next week.